Hockey Shit, Episode 16, Gretzky, Autobiography. My hero as a kid was a man with constant headaches, ulcers, and ringing in his ears. He's a funny little guy who stays up drinking coffee every night until 3 o'clock in the morning, even though he's got to be work at 8 the next day. He doesn't have to work if he doesn't want to, yet he never misses a day. In fact, he can now afford anything he wants, any house, any car, but he won't take any of it. He stays in the same house, driving the same car, teaching the same kids the way he always has, believing in the same things he always has. He was my hockey instructor. He was my lacrosse, baseball, basketball, and cross country coach not to mention my trainer and chauffeur. He's still my coach, but he's also my agent, manager, amateur lawyer, business partner, and best friend. He doesn't have a college degree, but he's probably the smartest guy I know. He's taught some other good players too. He has this kind of funny, pointed nose and crinkly smile, and his hair sticks up sometimes. He can't go anywhere in Canada without people saying hello to him. His name is Walter, but I call him Wally, or Dad. I'm crazy about his wife, Phyllis, too. I've sometimes said that I'm everything that I have, I owe to hockey. I guess that's not true. Everything I have, I owe to them. Don't get big-headed on me, my father would always say. No matter how good you are, there's always someone better. And I've always remembered that. Follow through whatever you commit to. He was always barking at me, and I try to do that. In my 11-year pro hockey career, I think I've only missed 26 games in one speech. He tried to teach me values. One day, when I was 11, I played a really bad game. I just wasn't into it, and he took me aside. There was a purple smoke coming out of his ears. You can't play a bad game, he yelled at me. People are going to judge you on how you perform every night. Never forget that. And I tried not to. But about 10 years later, during the 1983 Stanley Cup, we just lost game three, and we were down three games to none to the Islanders. We were practicing, and afterward, my dad came to me and said, Why did you practice today? Because we had to, I said. Everybody had to. Well, you shouldn't have. You just wasted your time in theirs. You didn't give any effort. That was the last we talked about it until later that summer. Ever since then, the highest compliment you can pay to me is to say that I work hard every day in every practice or game, and that I never dog it. Bobby Orr once said of Mario Lemieux, on sheer ability, Mario's good enough to win scoring titles with a broken stick. On pure talent, he's the best there is. But Wayne almost never disappoints you. He comes to work every night. And if it's true, it's thanks to my dad. I've been lucky though. I've always managed to avoid the ultimate hazing, the shave. The shave involves being tied down and having your, I can't imagine it in a G rated book shaved. Actually, you didn't even have to be a player to have this done to you. One time, Ace and Cowboy, Bill Flett, even managed to nail a sports writer. That was the end of it. Until next night. About 30 minutes before game time, we suddenly heard the giant motor revving outside the door. In stomped Rimmer, looking like Freddy Krueger with a chainsaw, going full boil. He marched over to our sticks and cut them all in half. About 60 of them. It became as known as the Edmonton Chainsaw Massacre. Kevin and Mess became my two best friends in the world. The first time I saw Mess skate, I thought, my God, how did they get this guy with the 48th pick? Moose, as everybody called him, is just totally free spirit. He is also the ultimate competitor. One time, Jamie McCune of Calgary cheap shot at him. Mess didn't forget. He waited until the next period at his first chance and steamrolled him. Just flattened him like a pancake. And before McCoon was even down on the ice, Mess was on him. Mess broke his jaw 
and that put Makun out for a month. That's the kind of competitor Mess was. He was a Slats kind of guy. Slats favorite player. With Slats kind of fire, but a hundred times the talent Slats had it as a player. Mess is the monster on the ice, but off it, he's a softy. He's the most generous guy I know. He'd not only give you the shirt off his back, but his shoes, his car, his house. Mess's dad played pro hockey with the Portland Buckaroos, and Mess was a stick boy for a while. I can just see this little seven-year-old yelling, Come on, guys. Let's get it done. The killer thing was, I had an easy shot in the last few seconds. I'd beaten everybody, deked out the goalie, an absolute no-brainer. Both could have flipped it in, but instead, air railed it high over the glass. My dad always told me, put the puck upstairs, but that thing was in the attic. Turns out that goal would have given me the scoring title. It came down to the last game of the night. I'd finished my season. Winning or tying nine of our last 10 games, we'd clinch a last playoff spot, and we'd all went out to celebrate. Marcel was playing in LA, so it was going to be late before we found out what he had done. Finally, I couldn't stand it anymore. I jumped up from the table and I called out there. Marcel had gotten enough points to tie me. I was a bit depressed, but I tried not to show it. Then it was announced that they don't split the Art Ross trophy for the scoring leader and had given the whole thing to Marcel based on more goals. I didn't know what the rule was until then, and I didn't agree with it either. What did that say to all these kids who had heard a thousand times an assist is as important as a goal? Marcel was cool about it. He said he'd polish the trophy up because he knew I'd be winning it a lot from then on. Marcel could be generous that way. He'd do anything to help the league, but he also knows how to carry a grudge. Even though I'd won the Art Ross Trophy nine times, I still believe the rule should be changed, so team play can be honored. To me, the best hockey players are the ones who make their teammates look good and the ones who make their teammates win. Truth is, we were all great goal scorers and juniors. In my book, learning to thank them instead of me is what makes you a professional. It's what makes you a winner. If there's one thing I'd like to be remembered as, it's that I tried to think of them more than me. The simple answer is to create the Gordie Howe Award for the guy who scores the most goals in the season. Give the Art Ross Trophy to the scoring title leader. If there's a tie, both names go on it. That year, they also announced I couldn't win the Calder Trophy as Rookie of the Year. They said my season in the WHA counted as a year in pro hockey, even though my WHA points could not count towards my career totals. It shows you how much the NHL was worried about the WHA at that time. I did win the Lady Ming Trophy as the most gentlemanly player. Some guys might rather win a case of lipstick, but I was proud of it. Then, totally out of the blue, I got the call that I'd won the Hart Trophy as the most valuable player. Everybody was shocked, stunned, and amazed, but nobody more than me. I couldn't believe it. I thought, I'm still only the rookie could win it. Even if only Wally and I recognize it, it's still only one of the things I'm most proud of, winning it in my first NHL year, and it made me forget all the other things I'd said that year in regards to hardware. But this captaincy business was tricky. Up to that point, the Oilers had for some reason or another traded away every captain they had had while he was still wearing the C. Even one, Ron Chipperfield, was sent to Quebec on the NHL tread deadline while he was away from the team visiting his terminally ill mother. That one shocked us all, but it was also the ultimate wake-up call. With Glenn Sather, the team always came first. That's why, when Foji presented me with the C, I thought twice about whether I wanted it. These days, the Oilers' captain is Mess, and Mess will never be traded. 
if they're ever going to preach any loyalty to the Oilers club, Mark has to be the guy they keep forever and then retire his sweater. I think Sather would quit before he trade mess. Of course, I, I'd been famously wrong before. I wasn't your typical captain. I was real quiet. Never would say anything too bad to anybody. Mess just shoots from the hip. He comes into the locker room and says, Man, you've been brutal tonight. Get going. And whoever it is, gets going. He wasn't afraid to kick a guy in the butt to get him going. I couldn't do that. So I tried to lead by example. Practice harder than everybody. Play harder. I made it a point to take in every new kid for a couple of days until he got himself an apartment and a car. Slats taught me that. The problem was, my shoulder was killing me. It got pinched against the boards early in the season when Dave Hale Taylor hit me from behind. Now, it was starting to ache. I wanted to rest it, but I couldn't. No matter how much the shoulder hurt, the streak kept going. 35 games. 40. It sort of had a life of its own. By the second period of game 41 in Minnesota, I had four goals, four assists, eight points. But I was so exhausted, I spent the entire intermission on the trainer's table. I couldn't move. And I was gassed. I had absolutely nothing left. I went on the ice for the last period. I could barely hold my stick. Just then, Murray retrieved the puck in the neutral ice and tried to flip it past me to his defenseman, Doug Wilson. I managed to bat it with my stick. It bounced high, so I reached up and slapped it to the ice with my left glove, using my body to keep Murray away. With Murray draped all over me, I got over the blue line and slapped it into the open net with one second left. Not that I was worried or anything. We played game 49 in LA and my shoulder got mangled some more. We had three days off in Palm Springs before we had to go to Vancouver. Good thing, because I could barely move it. When we got to Vancouver, real disaster struck. I couldn't find my lucky garter belt. See, hockey players use garter belts to keep their socks up and I'd use the same one throughout my whole streak. It got so beat up and raggedy that I had to use a dime in place of a button to keep it all together. Didn't matter. I wasn't going to change it. Not that I'm superstitious, but when we got to Vancouver, I couldn't find it. We'd left it in Palm Springs, so they gave me a new one. I tried to tear it and mangle it a little bit so it looked like the old one, and reluctantly, I put it on. It must have worked. I got two goals and two assists and kept the streak alive. Unfortunately, my shoulder fell dead, and somehow I kept it going that night and two nights later at home against New Jersey with a goal 61 and 50 games. On that night would have been 52 straight. We were playing the Kings. Their goaltender was Marcus Madison. I'd always had good luck against him, but that night Marcus Madison sucked up every shot I took. My only chance came when I hit Charlie Huddy with a pass in the second period and he missed a wide open net. Charlie felt sick about it, but hey, I've missed many wide open nets and missed them by two parked cars. Actually, I felt like thanking Charlie. The streak was over. I'd gotten 61 goals and 92 assists for 153 points in 51 games. Exactly three points a game. And I was relieved. I could finally rest. I sat out the next six games. Unfortunately, Yari Curry sat them out and we lost five straight. That was also the year I made a few thousand enemies in New Jersey. We beat the Devils 13 to four one night and I felt so bad for their two goalies, Chico Resch and Ron Lowe. That said, they're putting a Mickey Mouse operation on the ice. They better start getting some personnel. It's ruining hockey. You'd have thought I'd crude, you would, you would have thought I criticized Miss Newark or something. The fans went crazy against me. To this day, I go to New Jersey, and there's still the occasional Gretzky is goofy sign. 
I probably shouldn't have said it, but I was feeling so bad about the way we killed them, and I liked some of their guys. That flight home was quiet. They gave us the Campbell Cup for winning the conference championship, and everybody looked at it once and put it down. It was, it's sort of an unwritten rule that the team not to give that thing a second look. The only trophy cared we cared about was a lot bigger. Another thing I tell you about is my fear of flying. Just count how many times I've been on a jet while it's taking off for landing, and that's about how many times I've wished I'd taken up another profession. It didn't get any better when I joined the Oilers. My first mistake was sitting next to our play-by-play -play announcer, Rod Phillips. He was a worse flyer than I was. Just before takeoff, he'd start rubbing the seat, and his knuckles would get all white. He got so bad, the one time, flying in from Quebec City, they had to physically lie on me to calm me down. I was shivering so much, they had to put a blanket on me. Yet I was sweating so much, I ruined my clothes. I was speaking at a banquet that night, so we had to borrow clothes once we got there. When I got up to the podium, I looked like I was homeless. In those days, I would do anything not to fly. Sometimes, when I was in Edmonton and we played Calgary, Mike and I would drive the three hours to Calgary instead. I always worried about his car breaking down. I kept seeing the headline, Gretzky Hicks Hitch to Game 5 credits plumber in 57 Chevy. I tried everything to beat my fear of flying. I even tried a hypnotherapist. We met him at 7 a.m. We went to his back door. We didn't need any more publicity about this thing than we were already getting. Everybody said this guy was a very good. Mike Barnett came with me and the guy sat me down in a chair. He had me stare at this diamond ring for a long time as he talked. Pretty soon the diamond ring started spinning just like the movies. I don't remember a thing after that. Then the guy began asking me about my past history of flying. Turns out, I had all these stored up incidents that I had blocked out of my memory. He told me, from then on, I should sit with my hands on my knees on the plane, look at the ring, and think about how comfortable I was. It sounded great, but it only worked for about a month, and then I was as bad as ever. I took mind control classes. Up till then, they wanted us to walk over hot coals. Nope. Finally, on one flight, a pilot snuck up to me in the cockpit to show me all the buttons and gears and exactly how it all works. For some reason, that really helped. It made me feel safer. Now, sometimes, when I fly a Canadian airline, I sit in the cockpit during the flight, and I feel more relaxed. I finally got much better at flying during the trade from Edmonton to LA Kings. Just before the deal was finalized, Bruce McNeil said to me, look, before I make this trade, you should think about the travel that you're going to have to do. Los Angeles is a long flight from a lot of places. If you don't think you can handle it, you can get probably go east or Detroit or someplace where you won't have to travel as much. And I knew right then I wanted to come to LA so bad I was going to beat it. Now, if you see me on the plane, I won't look scared out of my mind, but I was different than you might think. In fact, the first thing is you'll say is, you're so small. I don't look much like a pro athlete. I'm 5'11", 165, or 170. I look more like the guy who bags your groceries at the local supermarket. Some guys think you've got to be 6'3", 250 to play professional sports. It's not so true of hockey, but even so, I've always wished I was bigger. I've always wished I little, looked a little bit rougher on the ice, like Rocket Richard, with all those black eyes staring a hole in your chest. My face is kind of narrow, so it makes my helmet look two sizes too big. I don't have a big old Sequoia arms like Gordy Howe. Mine look more like toothpicks. I'm skinny. Somebody once told me I could fit in a McDonald's straw. I can't sh skate at the speed of sound like Paul Coffey. I don't have the slap shot of death like Bobby Hole. 
I don't click in my teeth in the morning and go bang in the corners. The way I see it, the corners are for bust ups and stamps. We took individual strength and stamina tests at the Oilers two times a year, every year. I always finished dead last. I had the worst peripheral vision on the team. My flexibility was the worst and my strength was the worst. I only bench press 140. Because I don't look too mean, people are always trying to figure out how in the world I've done so well. Sun scientists even theorize that my motor neurons fire faster than most people's, and we all know how painful that can be. Therefore, I'm one fraction of a second ahead of everybody else on the ice. Some say I have a sixth sense. People are always telling me, you must have eyes in the back of the head. You just seem to be two seconds ahead of everybody on the ice. Baloney. I've just learned to guess what's going to happen next. It's anticipation. It's not God-given. It's Wally-given. He used to stand at the blue line and say to me, Watch. This is how everybody does it. Then he'd shoot a puck in along the boards to the corners and go chasing after it. Then he'd come back and say, Now, this is how the smart player does it. He'd shoot it into the corner. Only again this time, he cut across to the other side, picked it up over there. Who says anticipation can't be taught? It was something he taught me every day. On the way to hockey games, the Blue Goose, he'd quiz me. Where's the last place a guy looks before he passes? The guy he's passing to. Which means, get over there and intercept it. Where do you skate? To the puck is going, not where it's been. If you get cut off, what are you going to do? Peel. Which way? Away from the guy, not towards him. And on and on for miles. I had them all memorized. My dad taught me a million things. Like to practice stick handling in the summer with a tennis ball. Even as a pro, I still do it. Using a tennis ball is how I learned to bat pucks out of the air so well. And because I can swap pucks out of the air, it's easier to hit me with a long pass. And yes, a, lo a long pass gets you a lot of breakaway goals. In practice, I try weird things. Guys will say, you're never going to do that in a game. True, but once in a while, some things work. I learned to bounce passes off the side of the net in practice. A defenseman could be between me and my teammate, and I learned you can still get it to him by bouncing it off his, the side of the net. I practice it so much, I can now do it from any direction. Why not? It's illegal. It's the same with the sideboards. People say there's only six men on the ice, but really, if you use the angle of deflection off the boards, there's seven. If you could count the net, that's eight. From the opening face-off, I always figure we had a mate on six. The craziest thing I ever tried was against St. Louis, goaltender Mike Lute. I was stuck behind the net. There were two defensemen on either side of me, yet they weren't coming to get me. All I could do was flip the puck over the net, off Lute's back, and into the goal. Boy, was Lute surprised. I kind of felt bad about it, but it was either that or stand back there until the ice melted. That same night, I scored not once, but twice off the face-off. It's still the only two times as a pro I've ever done it. I loved going behind the net, but I didn't invent it. Bobby Clark of the Philadelphia Flyers did it first. The first time I tried it, I was 14, playing 19 and 20 year olds in junior B. It was the Phil Esposito era where everybody wanted these guys of size of condominiums to stand in the slot. I got knocked over so many times in front of the net that my coach, Gene Pompel, told me to try playing behind it. The net is like having another man back there protecting you. You can use it as a pick if a guy chases you and you go to the other side. If two guys flank you on either side, you flip it to someone coming to the net. If anybody goes with you, you stick it in the goal and go sit on the bench. I remember one night against Hartford, they must have decided before the game that they weren't going to let me come back there. Come hell or high water. They were going to stop me from passing, but not go after me. So the first time I went back there, I must have stood there for 20 seconds. It almost became comical. I 
I get a kick out of people who ask me if I have a favorite spot where I like to beat the goalie. Paul Coffey, when he was with the Oilers, used to tell me about that. I'd come back to the bench after making a goal, and he'd pretend to have a microphone and say, Looks like you were going for just right of the kneecap there, eh, Gretz? That's right, Paul. I'd say tongue-in-cheek, but I had to turn the puck on its side that time, and it was a real small hole. I do like to do thing one thing on goaltenders. I like to wait them to death. I refuse to panic. Hold the puck, hold it longer, hold it some more. That drives them into a frenzy. They can't help but guess you're, if you're about to shoot it, lean just a little one way, and that puts them off balance, and flick, you could just go the other way just like my dad always taught me. I learned how to count down the seconds on the clock without looking. From 30 seconds on down, I'm almost perfect. Most guys panic and make a bad pass or a bad shot, thinking they're out of time. I respect my traditions. I never vary. I get dressed the exact same way every day. Left shin pad, left outer pad, then right, same order, left sock, Hockey sock, shin pad, then pants, then left skate, right skate, shoulder pads, then left elbow pad, right elbow pad, sweater, tuck the right side, and go out on the ice for warm-ups. Always miss the first shot wide right. Come in after warm-ups, have a Diet Coke, ice water, Gatorade, then another Diet Coke. I'm always the first guy on the ice after the goalie, going out for the start of each period, unless my old teammate... Dave Semenko wasn't in the lineup for some reason, in which case I was always the last. I refused to get a haircut on the road because the last time I did, we lost. I refused to fly on Friday the 13th for obvious reasons, and don't ask me why I do these things. Right before game, I know this sounds weird, I eat like a prisoner. I play my best on four hot dogs, oozing in mustard and onions. Maybe, because no defenseman wants to get near me after that. I eat about five hot dogs before game one of our big playoff of Montreal and got five assists. For game day breakfast, I'll have two or three scambled eggs with bacon, whole wheat toast, coffee, or tea, then a steak or some veal for lunch, some vegetables, a salad, and dessert. And then, just before I go on the ice, I'll have a sandwich, a milkshake, and a big piece of pie. My training regimen was pretty simple. No weights, no running, no biking, no steroids, no special vitamins. In the off-season, I work out with my wife and her aerobics tape. She does it with ankle weights on. And for about 40 minutes, play a lot of tennis, some basketball, and eat right. That's it. Long ago, Wally helped me figure out the best reason I'd been so successful. I let the puck do all the work. People think that you have to be a good hockey player. You have to pick the puck up, teak around 93 guys, and take this ungodly slap shot. No. Let the puck do all the moving and get yourself in the right place. I don't care if you're Carl Lewis. You can't outskate that little black thing. Just move the puck. Give it up. Give it back give it up. It's like Larry Bird. The hardest work he does is getting open. The jump shot is cake. That's all hockey is, open ice. And that's my whole strategy. Find open ice. Chicago coach Mike Keenan said it best. There's a spot on the ice that no man's land. All the good goal scorers find it. It's a piece of fresh frozen real estate that's just between the defense and the forward. For a defenseman, it's hell because he doesn't want to commit. It's too far out and leaves other people open. And yet, if he leaves you alone, you get a free shot. Part of Wally's training always encouraged me to find my own tricks. I remember one of the reasons I always had trouble playing the New York Islanders was because they had the same color pants we did. I know where everybody near me is, but I do it by taking quick side glances without pulling my head up. You don't have to see a guy's insignia on a sweater to know what team he's on. You just need a split second glance. But the Islanders' pants were so much like ours. I kept getting them confused. I'm big on using my feet. I try to make them as useful as my stick. Why not? Everybody's watching your stick, and you can kind of skate past the puck like you've missed it and reach back with your feet. 
I think I worry about, I think I worry more about equipment than anybody in the league. My sticks almost have no curve. I don't have a great slap shot anyways, so I don't need curve for that. And with a straighter blade, I can stick handle better and control my backhand better. I use one of three of the heaviest sticks in the NHL because I like my wrists aren't strong enough to use a whippy stick. If it's whippy, I can't control it. As the season goes on, I use shorter and shorter sticks. By the end of the year, it's one and a half inches shorter than it was in October. I figure I'm getting more and more tired as the year goes on, and that little extra lightness might help me get a couple of pucks come April. I baby my sticks. I tape them all myself, and that's a lot of sticks. The night I broke Gordy's points record, I used 14 sticks. My blade is as wide as it possibly can be. I don't ever want to be one of those guys who is always saying, dang, the puck just bounced over my stick. Why let it happen? It's like the big tennis racket. Why would you play the small one when the big ones are legal? I also never understood why guys would use white tape on their blade instead of black. The black is softer and thicker, which cushions the puck. The only advantage of white tape is that it's a little less sticky. But all you have to do is powder the black tape and you'll get rid of the stickiness. But, but you can hope to develop any stick handling abilities. You have to be smart enough with your stick. You can blindfold me and hand me a stick that's a quarter of an ounce off, and I can tell you it's not my stick. It's the same way with skates. One time my bootmaking company, Bauer, kept sending me skate models, and I kept sending them back. There was something that was just a little bit wrong, but I couldn't figure it out. Finally, after I'd driven them all crazy with my seventh inch try, I'd found it. It feels like I'm skating downhill, I said. Bauer checked into it and realized that the blade they were sending me were one degree steeper than the old ones I had. I'd always skated in a very tight skate. I think it gives me more control. I don't want anything slipping and sliding at all. I wear a size 10 sh sh street shoe, but a size 8.5 skate. Most people's feet would go numb about 15 minutes, but my toes are double jointed so I can curl them up and not have it bother me. At the same time, I want the leather to be super soft so I can just flop my foot over one way and turn on a dime. If they're stiff, they don't give sideways, you can't turn as quickly. I just never could wear hard, molded skates. My dad always taught me to wear the lightest equipment they make. It's a feel game and you can't feel the stick with riot gear on. So I always wear the lightest gloves and the lightest pads I can find. I might be cold when I get in, but a few goals will warm me right up. We talk a lot about referees and I think they deserve respect. God knows they're underpaid and over abused. I'll argue with them, but I'll not try to embarrass them. If I do, I'll apologize after the game and I'll send them a letter. I've done plenty of times. They've got feelings just like everybody else. If you ask me, I tell you there are a few things I'd like to change about my game. I'd like to be better at defense. For instance, Coffee used to, used to kid me about it. He'd call me Flamingo because when a shot came near me, I'd put up one leg underneath the other, trying not to get hit. And I wish my shot was harder too. Although I don't think you have to put a hole in the boards. You just have to be quick and bang it in there as fast as possible. Some guys have missiles for shots, but if it takes three months to load up a fire, what good is it? I'm notorious for being no good at breakaway chances. I don't know what happens except that maybe I think too much. There are days when I can't beat anybody on a breakaway. One time at a charity event, they had me going against a priest. Our trainer Sparky said to me, you know Gretz, you don't have a chance. If you score, you'll spend 10 years in purgatory. The priest shut me down. They then had me go up against George Flimpton, the author, and he stopped me too. I wish I didn't swear so much on the ice. I don't do it a lot, but I get out there, and in the heat of the battle, I lose it and turn the air a little blue. The bad part is that my mom can read lips on TV. In fact, a lot of people, I found out, can read lips on TV. 
to any kids out there who have heard me, I apologize. I hope it's not a part of my game you'll emulate. Something that's always hacked me off is this lie that there's some unwritten commandment that nobody in the league will hit me. I know those guys well, and some people totally have the wrong impression of some of them. Take Dave Semenko. Most people see 6'3", 220 monster, built like a refinery, and they shrink into the wallpaper. When I first laid eyes on him, I said, I want this cow on my line so I can look after him. People always called him my bodyguard, but that wasn't true. He was everybody's bodyguard. He was also a fine hockey player. That year we won our first Stanley Cup, Semenko played the best hockey of his life. Semenko was also one of the most hilarious characters you'll ever meet. He was usually in hot water with Sather over something or another. I remember one time, he had been out at a bar doing those 12 ounce curls he was so fond of, and he got in about a half hour after curfew. He sneaked through the back door, took the employee's elevator to his floor, and figured he had it made. But when he walked into his room and turned on the lights, there was Slats, sitting in a chair. And did you have a good night? Sather asked him. It turned out to be a $500 question. Semenko was far and away the greatest fighter I ever saw. He'd knock guys out with just one punch, then hold them up so it didn't look so bad. Most of the time, though, he would just scare his opponents. He's just so huge and has such a wild look in his eye that nobody would dare test him. And he, all he usually had to do was issue his, fav his famous line, Maybe you and I should go for a canoe ride. And the guy would start bouncing off or backing off. Uh, Wayne, I'd forgot to tell you about the house. If I were you, this didn't sound good. They're trying to deal you. They're what? They're trying to trade you. I swear. I know it's for a fact. I couldn't believe it, but I could tell from my dad's expression that it was true. The team wanted to trade me. The team that just two hours before I'd helped win its fourth Stanley Cup in seven years the team that was still young enough to win another three or four in a row, the team I'd, sure to, I'd retire with. Amazing how you can lose your appetite. My world was rocked. Now, they couldn't stop telling me all the details. But apparently, Paul Lincoln had been talking about dealing me for two years. He'd even got approached by Jerry Buss about it when, when Buss owned the LA Kings. But I didn't want any part of the deal. I didn't want to leave Edmonton. I didn't want to be a coach. I knew who was behind all this. Peter's other business were rumored to be in serious trouble. Oil, meat, packing, land. He sold his expensive art collection. He'd even put up the Oilers as collateral against a loan. My contract was an asset. He thought it would be a great way to late raise cash. Anyways, when I was flying back to Los Angeles with Bruce for the past conference in Edmonton, all these memories were going through my mind. I was comparing Peter to Bruce. Bruce is not to manipulate anybody. He is straight up and honest. I knew that during our contract negotiations, we did it in 10 minutes on that flight home. How much do you want to make? Bruce said. First of all, you have to realize that Bruce had just made this huge deal without having signing me. He says, you know, I just paid 15 million for a player whose present contract value gives him the right to retire in two years. When Mike told me that story, it blew me away. How much do you want to make? He said, well, guess what? You have to pay me 20 million a year. Or I'm not playing. I don't know. I said, just pay me what you think I'm worth. Well, help me out. I have no idea. He said, Magic Johnson makes $3 million a year. How about that? No, no, I said. That's be way too much. You want a percentage of the team, he asked. How about 10%? No, no, no. I don't want that either. Too much worrying. Look, pay me this, I said. I wrote a number on a piece of paper. No, 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 no. 
That's too low, he said, and wrote a different number down. This must have been the craziest contract negotiation in the history of sport. He was arguing my side, and I was arguing his. In the end, we decided on $2 million a year base salary. When our first game arrived, I was nervous. I hadn't been that nervous since my first All-Star game. The LA form was buzzing. This was big time. They had Roy Orbison playing the national anthem. If you can believe that, we were playing Detroit, and the stands were loaded with stars. It was a sellout. Mike Downey, the columnist for the LA Times, called it Hockey Wood. Magic Johnson sent balloons. It felt like the start of something. Things always happen to me when the lights are the brightest and everybody's holding their breath. On my first shot in my first game in a new uniform in this new arena in this new town with all these people watching, I scored a goal. What is it they say in hockey would? Cut. That's a wrap. All right, I know what you're thinking. Gretzky wants to get rid of fighting. There's nobody in the league he can beat. And of course, you'd be right. I think I've been involved in three fights in my life and have gone o, o, three. When a fight breaks out, the first thing I do is look for a little guy I can grab. Now they're easy to find because they're looking for me. Neither one of us particularly likes the thought of having any more new teeth. Before the game, I tell my teammates exactly who I want on the other side when the fight breaks out. I used to always look for Pierre LaRouche or Winnipeg's Thomas Chardin. Gridden. Now it's Yari. Then we just sort of hold on to each other by the shoulders and ask if we're going to each other's charity golf tournament. How's the family? Very nice. How's business? Great. Oops, watch it. They're coming this way. Then when it's done, okay, tap. Nice to see you again. The worst I ever got was the night against Doug LaCour of Chicago. He was playing me really tight and hitting me a lot, so I dropped my gloves and hit him. I don't think I hit him very hard. In fact, I think it was just the surprise of things that shook him. Finally, he just sort of grabbed me and threw me down and said, Okay, just hold on. I won't hit you. And I said, Sounds good to me. And that was it. We each got a five-minute penalty for waltzing. People always ask me, Are hockey fights for real? Yes. They're real. If they weren't, I'd get in more of them. I know fights bring some people into the building. Fights probably bring a lot of people into the building. But how many people do they keep out of the building? Especially in in Tenement, L.A. Well, we don't go to the games because it's too violent. To me, that's too sad. If hockey is ever going to become accepted over the continent, we have to start convincing the American public that it's a great sport. Have you ever noticed during the playoffs the number of fights goes to about zero? That's when our best hockey is played, and if that isn't proof we don't need fighting, I don't know what is. But in the archaic world of the NHL, fighting rolls on. The depressing thing is, as as much as I talked about it, I've made absolute zero progress on it. Every time I bring it up to the league, they point out to these studies about how many people want fighting. So here's my plan. One, end the fighting. Make it illegal, period. If you fight, you're out of the game. Two, expand. The NHL is going into places like San Francisco Arena next year. Great. Now expand to Seattle, Houston, and maybe Milwaukee. Three, rename the conferences. It's periodical to call them the White Wales Conference and the Campbell Conference, and it doesn't help much to have the Adams, Norris, Smythe, and Patrick Divisions. We have enough trouble trying to explain the blue line to people. Just call them East and West. Number four, realign the conferences. Everybody wants to blame the president, John Ziegler, for the NHL's problems, but he's pretty good. The trouble is that some of the owners only do what's best for their own team. Number five, bring on free agency. Why shouldn't we fight for it? Free agency hasn't hurt any other professional sport. It's only helped baseball. Now football is getting it. Number six, institute a weekly off plan. By the end of February, the players are so spent and the fans and owners don't get out of us all they could. The owners have us running all over the country, give each team five consecutive days off in January, February. Number seven, let the players make the rules. 
number eight, play the refs more. The ref, top referee in the entire league, makes 85000 Number nine, bring back ESPN. With the NHL show Sports Channel Analytics over ESPN, it was another decision by the league to choose the quick buck over the long-term effects. Who sees sports channels anyways? I'll tell you who. The only one in the U.S. homes, that's who. ESPN, who had been bought the NHL rights before. Number 10, let us play in the Olympics. Every three or four years, the best players give up seven weeks of their summer to play in an international tournament, the Canada Cup. Granted, it makes the Players Association a lot of money. The Olympic Games uh, rules allow us to play. The NHL doesn't. If our stars played in the Olympics, they would be seen by new markets that might stimulate interest in followers.